Yes, thank you, Sammy. We are recording this. Uh, so welcome everyone to our Monarch Workshop. I am going to start off with a little bit of a sad slide or two, just a couple sad slides. But of course, the reason why you are all here is because the monarchs are facing trouble right now. And so I think in order to know how to help them out, we need to hear a few sad facts about why they are in trouble. So here comes a couple of sad slides. Um, the Western monarch is definitely experiencing quite a population crash right now. Um, the slide that I have here shows uh, a reduction from 1.2 million in the late 90s down to just a few thousands in the last couple of years. But the crash is actually worse than that. Um, in the 1980s, there were 4.5 million uh, estimated Western monarchs. So to have gone from millions and millions of these butterflies down to just a few thousand is definitely problematic. Um, it's generated a lot of concern. Monarchs are, are beautiful and amazing. They're an important pollinator of California native plants. <clears throat> and they have a really significant place in many cultures. So this is one of the reasons why we are mobilizing to work with Solano County residents and farmers and ranchers to create monarch habitat and try and help bring these this amazing insects population back up. I want to say in the last couple of years that the population has slightly rebounded. It was literally down to just a couple thousand insects in 2020. And so these last couple of years, they have seen the population go up, but we're still nowhere near the numbers that they need to be at. Next slide, this is a little bit of specific information about why monarchs are declining. And, and really this is sort of a death by a thousand cuts, unfortunately. There are many reasons that why monarchs are facing trouble. Probably the first and foremost reason is a loss of habitat and degra de degradation of habitat. We've got things like urban sprawl, agriculture that relies on a lot of tilling and pesticide use. And those things have led to large uh, populations of milkweed plants being lost and eradicated. And as we're gonna talk uh, more as I go through this presentation, milkweed is absolutely essential for the health of monarch populations. Um, there's also some pesticides, particularly insecticides. Insecticides are pesticides that specifically target insects and kills them. And so there's been some changes in the types of insecticides being used. Neonicotinoids in particular are right now the most commonly used insecticide. And um, neonics are very problematic for monarchs because when people apply neonicotinoids to a plant, the insecticide is absorbed into the plant and then any insect that eats that plant dies. So when a monarch lands on a plant that's been treated with neonicotinoids, drinks the nectar from it, it has problems because it's actually absorbing that insecticide. So that's a big problem, neonicotinoids in particular. Also, there's been some loss of overwintering habitat as we're gonna talk a little bit more about um, monarchs cluster in a few trees along the coast of California. And that's where they spend the cold winter months. And so uh, if there's any loss of those overwintering groves, that's problematic for monarchs. Climate change, also a little bit problematic when you're talking about a, an insect that is relying upon a specific set of plants. Changes in rainfall patterns and temperature can sometimes have quite a dramatic effect. And then finally, one more reason why monarchs are declining is actually something that we can all do something about. The use of non-native tropical milkweeds in landscaping is particularly problematic for, for monarchs. Let me show you the next slide, which shows what the tropical milkweed looks like. You can go to many home and garden stores right now, and you will find these uh, milkweed plants that are advertised as milkweed plants. They are milkweed plants, but they're from the tropics. And um, they are they do not uh, drop their leaves in the winter like our native milkweeds do. And so as a result, since they keep their leaves all year round, there's a buildup of pathogens on these non-native uh, milkweeds. And um, when a monarch uh, caterpillar eats those leaves and consumes that pathogen, 
it actually causes it to become deformed. And so this is such a sad little picture here of a monarch coming out of its pupa and it is, these wings will, ne it will never be able to fly. And that is directly because it was exposed to this pathogen that occurs only on tropical milkweeds. So um, you can tell a tropical milkweed from a native milkweed because the tropical milkweeds have yellow, orange, and red flowers. All of our native milkweeds have white, pale pink or pale purple flowers. So we very much encourage people that if you have purchased tropical milkweed, go out and dig it up and compost it, please. Um, it definitely does not have a place in, um, in Solano County. It causes problems for those monarchs. So that's it for sad slides. And I know that some of those things sound pretty overwhelming, but I just wanna emphasize that there's a lot that homeowners can do on that list of problems that the poor monarch is having. You can plant milkweed plants. In fact, I'm hoping that all of you do as a result of attending this workshop. You can avoid using insecticides. Don't kill spiders. Don't kill aphids with insecticides. Find other solutions. Stay away from neonicotinoid insecticides in particular. And finally, don't use tropical milkweeds. So this is a pretty powerful set of things that all of us can do. And in fact, if we do do this, um, if, if everybody planted a waste station kit for monarchs in their yard, those monarchs would definitely be well on their way to recovery. So I'm glad you're all here learning about how to support monarch recovery. And with that, we're moving on to the happy, upbeat slides. All right. So before I get into exactly how we create habitat in Solano County, I want to have a, spend a couple slides here talking about a little bit about monarch biology, because it does actually factor into how we help them recover. So um, many people, when they think of monarchs, they think of the uh, eastern monarchs. The eastern monarchs east of the Rockies, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, I'm going to move it around here on the screen. The eastern monarchs travel down through the Great Plains down to Mexico where they overwinter far south. Um, and, and a lot of people think that that's what the western monarchs do also, but in fact very few western monarchs head south for the winter. Instead, most of the monarchs in California head to the coast. So instead of a north-south migration, what we have really is an east-west migration. So during the winter time, western monarchs are overwintering in forest groves along the central California coast. You can kind of see this red area here right on the edge of this of California on this screen, that's where the monarchs are overwintering in forest groves, usually within five miles of the ocean. And while they are there in those groves, they enter diapause. Diapause is kind of like hibernation for bears, but it's for insects. And so, so monarchs enter diapause. It's, uh, they are still uh, drinking some nectar from flowers, but they are definitely you know, conserving their energy to last throughout the winter. We have three overwintering sites in Solano County. Um, and after the monarchs have overwintered along the coast, they leave and head out east yes. into Nevada, Utah, and even as far as Colorado. It's kind of amazing that these insects can travel so far. And then they will head back again in the fall back to the coast where they will overwinter. So that is how the Western monarch migration um, occurs. And it's really kind of amazing to imagine these delicate insects with paper thin wings making round trips of 2000 miles. Um, and in fact, actually a single butterfly can't make that trip. It takes a whole set of generations of them. It's pretty amazing, but there's about five generations of monarchs that make that annual trip. Each monarch advances the wave of the population several hundred miles, lays its eggs, and then dies. And then it's the next generation that hatches out of those eggs, turns into a caterpillar, pupates into a butterfly, and continues the migration. So it's kind of an absolutely amazing um, chain of activities that have to happen. So the monarch life cycle. Um, most monarchs only live as butterflies for five weeks. That's why they can't make the whole 2000 mile journey by themselves. Um, 
Instead, you can see here that there's a there's about it takes about a month to go from the egg stage to the butterfly stage, and it all occurs on milkweed plant. So here's a little picture of the eggs. They're tiny little specks. Then they hatch into the caterpillars, which grow from small caterpillars into larger caterpillars. There's actually five different moltings that they go through. The caterpillars are very strongly banded with black, white, and yellow. Then they form a chrysalis. Here, this is a young chrysalis. It's bright green. And then um, about a month after this, the chrysalis opens up and an adult butterfly emerges. So now it's pretty interesting that most of the monarchs, each generation lives about five weeks and they advance that, that migration, heading out east and then back west in the wintertime. But the overwintering generation, the last generation of that whole chain of butterflies actually has to survive for six to nine months. They are the ones that enter that diapause in the overwintering groves and have to survive till the next spring. So it's actually super important that we protect that fifth generation each year, that last generation, because they are the ones that perpetuate the species into the next year. So here's um, some photos of all of the life stages of a monarch, and you want to be able to recognize each stage, because if you live in Solano County, you might have all of these stages in your yard, and you want to know that so that you don't do something that would cause it harm. So you've got the little tiny speck, and I don't know if you can see how tiny this is, this little speck of an egg, a little white egg, and it has little ridges on it. Then you've got the caterpillar, which could be quite small at the start of its life, but is going to be about as big as your thumb at the end after it grows full size. You've got the chrysalis, which could either be solid green or it could be quite late in the development. Just before it hatches, it actually becomes translucent. So you can sort of see that here. And then, of course, you've got the monarch butterfly, which I think everyone knows what that looks like. Um, so here in Solano County, as the monarchs are leaving those wintering grounds, it's the first generation that's passing through Solano County. And then your generations two, three, and four, they're out there in Nevada, Utah, or Colorado. And then you have the fifth generation coming back through Solano County in about September. So we see big pulses of monarchs early spring when the first generation is passing through kind of March, April. And then we have a, the fifth generation returning back through Solano County in August, September, October. We probably also have monarchs here throughout the summer, but um, some monarchs are heading all the way out into Nevada and Utah. So that is where they go during the summertime, many of them. Okay, now moving on to what monarchs need. So in most of Solano County, away from the coast, that is, what monarchs need is milkweed plants. And as I already mentioned, what they need is native milkweed plants. This is the only thing that monarch caterpillars eat. They only eat milkweed plants. Um, and so in fact, here is a uh, monarch caterpillar close to full grown in the caterpillar stage, chomping on a showy milkweed leaf. Um, so, however, butterflies need something completely different. They do not eat leaves. Um, let me go back actually. You can see, I love this picture. Can you see the little munch marks of it? The, the monarch caterpillar is taken out of this milkweed leaf. So they will actually, monarch caterpillars were, will completely defoliate a milkweed, consuming all that vegetation as they grow. But the monarch butterfly does not need milkweed leaves to survive. What they need is nectar. And so they will drink nectar from milkweeds, but they'll also drink nectar from another a number of other flowering forbs. So, so flowering plants are super important and flowering plants that, that, um, that allow uh, monarchs to access them is also good. Um, flat topped like this little uh, euthamia that this monarch is sipping. Uh, monarchs also benefit from having some native trees and shrubs around the flowering plants. They have paper thin wings and so on windy days they like to tuck down into shrubs and trees so that's a good thing. And also uh, during the hot summer it's not a bad idea to have a little source of water. If you do see uh, monarchs visiting your way station kit or plants in your yard and you can create a little shallow puddle of water on the dirt, monarchs will come and sip water there. 
So why milkweed? Why is milkweed so very important? Um, it's kind of interesting. Uh, here's a picture of a native milkweed here at the bottom of the screen, and you can see it's a white with a palish pink. Um, all parts of a milkweed plant contain um, toxic compounds. They're called cardenolides, and these toxic compounds developed in the monarch, excuse me, the milkweed plants to uh, deter herbivores from eating the plants. I suspect it tastes pretty foul. There's a really sticky, nasty sap that you get on your fingers if you ever break a monarch uh, leaf. I've never tasted the sap, but I suspect that it tastes quite bad. However, monarchs are immune to this toxicity and they actually can incorporate the cardenolide into their bodies. Um, the caterpillars eat all those leaves, they incorporate this toxin into their body. It's still there when they turn into a butterfly. And as a result, when a bird eats a monarch butterfly or a monarch caterpillar, it tastes really foul and they actually barf, barf the remains of the caterpillar back up. Doesn't help the caterpillar that got eaten, but scrub jays and other birds like this, they're intelligent creatures and they learn very quickly to avoid those brightly colored orange and white uh, butterflies or the black and yellow and white striped caterpillars. So that's why monarchs have become so tightly evolved with milkweed. It's because it actually protects them from their predators, chiefly birds. All right, so now what happens about the monarchs over at the overwintering sites? They actually need different things than the monarchs that are out breeding. Now remember, the overwintering sites are close to the coast and butterflies are in diapause when, when, when they're at these overwintering sites. And that means they are not breeding. They are resting up and conserving their resources so that they can um, kick off the next migration the next spring. So when all these butterflies return to those wintering groves on the coast of California, they look for large trees. A lot of times they want evergreen trees because they're looking for protection from wind. So pine trees, eucalyptus trees, eucalyptus aren't native, but they do host a lot of the, uh, the groves, the overwintering uh, clusters of monarchs. Here they are clustered on a pine tree on the coast here in this picture. Um, even though these uh, insects are in diapause, they still need to drink some nectar to keep their energy up. So flowering plants near overwintering sites is also very important. Um, and it takes some cleverness to get flowering plants in the winter time. So you've got to look hard to find plants that are actually blooming in December and January, but that's important for these overwintering uh, sites. What you don't want at the overwintering sites are any milkweed. And it's kind of, confusing because generations two through five are depending on milkweed, of course, to create food for the caterpillars. But when monarchs are overwintering, the presence of milkweed actually disrupts diapause. It causes monarchs to engage in reproductive behavior at the wrong time. It drains their energy. They, you know, laying eggs in January when it's freezing cold, not good. It's not a success story. And before tropical milkweed entered the picture, there really wasn't milkweed present near any of the overwintering sites. The problem is that people have planted tropical milkweed near overwintering sites. It doesn't lose its leaves. And so then it causes the monarchs to to really come out of hibernation, so to speak, at the wrong time. So um, let's look at the next slide. Since we do have three overwintering sites in Solano County, it's worth figuring out whether you should plant a monarch kit that includes milkweed or whether you should plant a monarch kit that includes winter flowering plants. So our three um, overwintering sites are all um, on the west side of the county. Two of them are in Vallejo. So this here is Mare Island, and this is Carquinas Heights right across here. And so certainly if you live in Mare Island, or if you live west of 80 right here, right on the bay, this would be within a few blocks of either of these sites, it would be good to get monarch kits that don't include milkweed. We actually also have a overwintering site in the middle of Fairfield. So look over here on the right hand side. This is Allen Witt Park. This is West Texas Street. So if you live in this area of, of Fairfield, 
you might want to consider not planting milkweed. And I would say just within a few blocks of the overwintering site, we consulted with Xerces, which is an organization that uh, does a lot of research on invertebrates, including uh, monarchs. And they said, as long as you're not planting milkweed right next to the overwintering groves, it should be fine. So we have two kinds of kits available, those with milkweed and those without. All right, moving on to milkweed species. So it's really important to plant the native milkweed species. Um, narrow leaf milkweed and showy milkweed are our two main natives. Um, these are milkweeds that go dormant and drop their leaves in the winter. There's a couple of other milkweeds that Solano RCD is looking into to see if we can get uh, heart leaf milkweed and woolly pod milkweed, but they are not commercially available right now. But we do have both narrow and showy milkweed available. The other thing, of course, as I've mentioned, is you want to have flowering nectar plants. So um, I think it's always best to use California native plants. Uh, remember, monarch butterflies don't eat milkweed leaves, but they need to sip nectar from these flowering plants. And we have them passing through Solano County starting in March and all the way through October. So it's good to plant a variety of California native plants so that the blooms are available at different times throughout spring through late fall. And then of course, if you live near an overwintering site, it's good to have um, winter blooming plants also. There's a lot of great plant lists available. Um, Sammy's gonna post some links in the chat. We're also going to put it, make it available on our um, website. And uh, there are lots of places to find these lists here that we, I put a couple here just on this slide. So also we have, uh, plant sales, native plant sales. Solano RCD holds them twice a year in the spring and the fall. And we are going to be selling way station kits, um, which are specifically monarch way station kits. And there's 36 plants in them, uh, six narrow leaf milkweed, six showy milkweed, and 24 nectar plants. And it's for $30. Um, and I have an even better deal for all of you uh, that have attended this Zoom workshop. We're selling um, one, uh, you may purchase one of the waste station kits for $15 at half off. We really want people to plant uh, these waste station kits. So if you wanna buy a second waste station kit, that's great, but we'll ask you to pay the full $30 for it, but it's still a great deal. These are these are plants that normally sell for two or $3 at our plant sale. And we're basically selling them for less than a dollar each. This kit looks like this. It comes in a little crate and the plants are small. They're in, uh, they're in pots that are about four inches deep by two inches by two inches at the top. Um, we've got a variety of nectar plants that will be included in this kit. And here's the little list right here. All right, I'm gonna go through uh, 10 simple steps for how to correctly plant our way station kits. And this really applies to all California native plants. These, this procedure that I'm gonna outline is what we do whenever we do habitat restoration uh, at our, our various sites throughout the county. So um, it's possible to uh, plant these kinds of plants in your own yard, just like it was a habitat restoration site. All right. This is gonna be a little tiny habitat restoration site. It's gonna be a hundred square feet. Um, you want it to be mostly in full sun. Um, the area can be square if you want, a 10 by 10 area, or if you've got like a side yard that gets a lot of good sun, uh, six feet by 18 feet is also about a hundred square feet. You do want access to a hose bib or some sort of irrigation system. The second step is to remove all weeds. Um, I gotta say milkweed uh, does not do well with competition. It, it needs the sun. It doesn't wanna have weeds growing around it. So, so you'll, you'll be able to have your, the best success if you really do some weed control before you plant anything. I recommend irrigating uh, your waste station kit area, your 100 square foot area deeply, maybe a week or two before you plan to plant. This softens the soil. It'll germinate weed seeds up and then you can go through and pull the weeds up easily or hoe them or however you're gonna control the, the weeds. Next, I always recommend installing some sort of irrigation system. If you already have irrigation to the area where you're planning to put your waste station, great. But if you don't and you think you're gonna hand water, I just gotta tell you that's, I mean, great if you can remember to do it, but when I say I'm gonna do that, I end up with dead plants. So I encourage everyone to uh, install a drip irrigation system. And 
Sammy and I have put together a kit and we are selling it at the cost that it took for us to buy the supplies. So it's a great deal. This is a drip irrigation kit. Uh, we're going to sell it for about $20. It depends on how, how long of a hose you need, but somewhere between $20 and $25. And the kit comes with a half inch main drip line. Uh, you use a hose bib coupler like this up here in the upper right corner to attach to the drip line and then it attaches to your hose bib. Um, let's see, I have one here. Let's see if I can put this into, I don't know if you guys can see this, but you'll take and jam the hose bib coupler on the end of the drip line. And then there's this collar that you actually have to take and screw back down onto the drip line. So you need to do that to put this firmly into place. So Sammy will be um, distributing these out to people at our plant sale. You should ask for a little demo and he'll show you how to correctly attach the, um, the hose bib coupler. And then you'll use a figure eight to close the end of the line off. You wanna take and run your main drip line along the edge of your waste station area. So here I've got my main drip line. That's a big black line on either side here of my square or my rectangular planting area. And then you'll use quarter inch spaghetti line. That's what I call this thin line. It uh, has emitters all along it every 12 inches. That's what these little tiny holes are at, the, at this red arrow. And you can see the water drips out at a rate of about a half gallon an hour. So you'll take and run your spaghetti line about every 18 inches across all of your planting area. You don't wanna have your spaghetti line run for longer than 20 feet or it won't get water all the way to the end. So um, it's helpful to use a measuring tape and make sure that you space your line out every 18 inches. That's what Sammy and I did when we built the, our, our little way station area. In fact, here it is. You can see our waste station here is laid out with drip line every 18 inches. We used a poker, which will come with your kit to poke holes into the main line. And then we used barbs. Here's a barb here. You shove this barb into the spaghetti line on one end and you poke it into the hole of the main line on the other end. So we gave you 15 of these barbs with each kit. And then finally you put a plug at the far end of the spaghetti line so that the water doesn't come leaking out. I recommend using a small pair of pliers to use the to install the barbs and the plugs because it's a little hard on the fingers otherwise. But uh, Sammy can give any of you a demo demonstration on some of this stuff uh, when you pick up your, your kits. Finally, you wanna take and actually staple your irrigation down to the ground. It's really important that these lines don't get kicked. If you've got a dog or a kid running around and you and they move these off of the plants, then the plants aren't being watered. So, so you can see here, there's a picture of Sammy right here using a mallet to staple down the, uh, the, the main drip line. And then I also think you wanna put a couple staples on each of the spaghetti lines so that it's fastened firmly down to the ground. And it really is helpful to use a hammer or a mallet to install this. Next, the fun part plant your 12 native milkweed plants. That's why we're all doing this. Um, I would recommend maybe a couple days before you do the planting to run your irrigation system for a couple hours. This will create wet spots and show you exactly where to plant the plants. So you wanna have 12 milkweed plants. And the reason is, is that those caterpillars chow down. And if you only plant two milkweed plants, you might end up in a situation where the caterpillar does not have enough leaves to survive. It needs to actually eat enough to grow to a size that it can then pupate. So we really wanna see people put 12 milkweed plants in. And uh, Xerces recommends that your milkweed plants be on the outside edge of your waste station area. This is because monarchs are visual, very visual, and they need to see the milkweed in order to come in and lay their eggs. So if you have a square layout, you might put your milkweed every other drip irrigation emitter, excuse me, every other line of the spaghetti lines spaced around the outside. And if you've got a long and skinny planting area, you might put them on either end. So there's our milkweed. Next comes the pollen, the, the nectar plants. So Xerces suggests that you plant your, your flowering plants in the middle of your milkweed. And actually you'll see that they're a little more crowded. That's fine. They, um, are mostly able to handle more competition 
from shade and growing next to other plants compared to the milkweed. The milkweed needs us some space. So that's why you see the milkweed is kind of on the outside, a little bit spaced out. It needs space to do well. So this layout's really important. It allows the caterpillars to travel easy, easily between milkweed plants. It lets the butterflies see the milkweed plants and it reduces competition um, from other plants on the milkweeds. All right, I wanna just quickly mention proper planting techniques. It's always good to plant your plant immediately below me. an emitter. I'm, I'm sorry, excuse me. Is there any possible way that you could go back to that last slide so I can take a picture of it, please? Yes, thank you so much. I, I apologize. Sure, no problem. We're gonna make this slideshow available to everyone. I should have said that. You will be able to download this whole slideshow. So if you've been frantically taking notes, I apologize. Um, no, it's a, the slideshow okay. will be available, yeah. All right, so proper planting techniques, you always wanna plant immediately below your emitter. So I made this little illustration here, this little drop is the, the water coming out. You want to dig a planting hole that's only one half inch deeper than your plant's root ball. That's really important. All these native plants, they do not wanna be subterranean. They wanna have, they wanna be planted at, so that the top of the, of the plant root ball is at about the same height as the native soil on either side. So you can see from this illustration what I'm shooting for here. Um, you wanna remove the plant from the container gently without yanking on its stem. You can try squeezing the pot, turning it over and tapping the container against the edge of a shovel. Sometimes that'll jar it out. Then I always put the plant into the hole and double check that my planting depth is correct. Sometimes they go a little bare root on you in the process of getting them out of their container. If that happens, no big deal. Just put some dirt in the bottom of your hole to get that height back up. You definitely do not wanna put a little stubby plant way in the bottom of a hole. Then you're gonna to wanna to gently tamp some garden soil in around the root ball, getting rid of all of the air pockets. And finally, the last thing to do is sprinkle a half inch of garden soil over the top of the root ball so that all of the potting soil is covered. Potting soil really is very porous. It leaks water out into the air easily. It evaporates off easily. And so we wanna take and use some of the native garden soil to kind of seal in the top of the plant. And so here is one of the waste station kits that Sammy and I installed right here. You'll see that because the uh, drip irrigation is every 12 inches along these emitters, you're gonna have some spots that have wet spots with no plants, no big deal, that's fine. We just bought what was available and inexpensive. So, you know, pick your layout so that it's kind of all 18 inches apart um, in the middle, the, the, the flowering plants and that your milkweeds are more like two feet apart. And um, if there's some wet spots that don't have a plant at it, that's okay. They'll eventually have plants. A lot of these plants like yarrow and gum plant, they drop seeds and you'll have milkweed growing also. So having a few wet areas, no big deal if there's not a plant at every single one. Um, like I mentioned, milkweed doesn't like competition. So if you can apply some mulch to keep down weeds, that's always a good idea. Um, two to three inches of mulch, though, is about a cubic yard of mulch, so that's no joke. Um, if you have the ability to get a arborist to drop off some mulch, great, um, or you can get like 10 bags of it from a, a garden supply store. You can also just go out and weed, right? That's what I actually did. I didn't use mulch on my way station. I go out and I weed every now and then, but the real point is, is that you want to you wanna keep weeds from, from growing up around your milkweed. If you do decide to use mulch, notice how on my photo here of little narrow leaf milkweed surrounded by mulch that Sammy and I put, I've made a little donut hole right around. You don't want mulch pressing up against the stem. Um, these are all native plants. They are actually adapted to do well without a lot of water, but when they're getting established, they need some water. So we recommend that you water once or twice a week between April and October. Probably in April and May, if it's nice and cool, once a week for an hour or two, that's going to be enough. In August, you're probably going to have to go twice a week for a couple of hours so that you get a little more water. You can just keep an eye on things. If they're wilty, then increase the, the water time. Once all these plants get established, then you can back way off on the amount of watering you do. But that first summer, that first spring, summer, and fall, you definitely need to help them out with some water. 
particularly the milkweed. It's funny, it, it takes a little bit to get milkweed established and it does need some water that first year or two. All right, last couple steps here. Um, nine, number nine, avoid the use of pesticides, particularly neonicotinoids. They are problematic for butterflies. They're problematic for all kinds of beneficial insects. So, so um, if you uh, plant one of these waste stations, I hope you can refrain from using insecticides around it. Um, studies have found that a large proportion of milkweeds um, sold in nurseries actually are contaminated with pests pesticides. It's pretty darn sad. But I can tell you that the stuff we're um, selling does not have pesticides on it. We've grown it ourselves and we don't we don't do use insecticides. Um, finally, number 10, don't mow or cut back your plants until October 31st. These plants will get scrappy. You're going to want to cut them back. It's actually beneficial to them to cut them back each winter and that way they'll come back. They're all perennials, but they die back to the ground each winter and then they come back like gangbusters each spring. But wait until October 31st. And the reason for that is, is because those monarchs are coming back through Solano County. They're leaving Nevada. They're coming over the Sierras. It's just amazing to think of these little insects doing that. And they're descending on Solano County October well, probably a little before October, September, and, and September or maybe early October. And so you don't wanna cut down your monarch way station until those insects are all the way over onto the coast where they're overwintering. And I guess really I should have had an 11th step here. Um, I encourage you that if you do wanna have a, a plant a way station kit to make a reservation with Sammy, you all have his email address. You can also reserve the irrigation kit. Um, we will be distributing these, selling and distributing these kits at our plant sale, uh, which we have twice a year, like I said, and this next one is Saturday, October 28th, from noon to five at Roostaller Farm, which is uh, a brewery, so you can come and have a drink, eat dinner, and purchase plants also, so um, Lots of options. If for some reason you want to buy a waste station kit and you cannot get to the plant sale, we'll make arrangements with you to pick it up at our office in Dixon. That's also totally possible. And then a little plug that if you care about monarchs and you want to spread the word, we would love it if you took a picture of your waste station kit installation. Bonus points if there's cute kids or pets involved in the planting. And if you were to post it on uh, social media and let Sammy know, we'll give you a free plant at our next native plant sale. We really want to encourage people to do this. Um, and, and one of the ways is for you to tell your family and friends, post it on Facebook or Instagram and tag Solano RCD. And that way we will um, hopefully get more people interested in helping uh, rescue monarchs. Other ways you can help, I'll just be real quick here. We're wrapping up. You can use your purchasing power. You can ask nurseries to not sell tropical milkweed if you feel comfortable doing so. You can ask them to not sell plants treated with insecticides, which are a real problem. You can also buy organic or non-GMO corn and soy products. Um, you can advocate for overwintering sites. We have three of them here in our county, but there are many more in on California. Monterey has gotten a number of them. And you can also volunteer for citizen science projects. Uh, a couple of our coworkers, Sarah and Orla, are organizing the Monarch Count this year. We've got a Thanksgiving Monarch Count and a New Year's Count. So we'll be doing Monarch Counts. And if you would like to receive training on that and help participate in that citizen science project, it will help us figure out if the population numbers are continuing to improve like we, fingers crossed, we hope they are. So. So there's lots of ways you can help in addition to planting um, a waste station kit. And here's some resources where you can learn more information. I think Sammy's gonna post these links in the chat, but like I said, this will also be, this PowerPoint will also be available to you. We'll send you it uh, or send you a link to it on our website. Um, and so uh, there's some great resources here, uh, lists of uh, native plant lists, also um, ways to learn uh, some videos on how to participate in the monarch count, how to map monarchs, other, other cool ways to assist. And with that, I think I am all done. And I'm going to stop sharing and just 